Good morning, y'all. I'm going to let the room fill up a little bit. I am also All right, while this fills up, I am going to make sure that we are all good with everything. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it's good to see everybody virtually this morning on a, let's see. Sunny, at least Friday morning here in Northeast Ohio. Um, for anybody who was with me earlier in the week, I, I cannot thank you enough for the patience everyone showed while we worked through the technical difficulties. Um, a lot of people told me I'm the only person they know who's been Zoom bombed. Uh, it was certainly an experience. Um, it, it inspired a bit of artistic flair. So I'm going to start with my uh, my quarantine haiku for the day. We'll move on to the uh, Q&A or uh, summary of where we are with the uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act in, in light of the regs that the DOL published uh, late on Wednesday. I'm going to open it up to questions um, and then um, I just woke up my daughter who promised me she'd come down um, and share uh, a new song uh, with y'all um, right at the end. So if you have questions, everybody's microphone is muted. I don't believe anybody can unmute their mics. At least you shouldn't be able to. Um, uh, if you have questions, uh, please type them in the in the um, please type them in the chat box. And once we get through my um, uh, my little uh, summary of kind of where we are, uh, I'll open it up and I'll start kind of reading through the questions that everybody has. Um, so I'm going to start with my haiku my artistic uh, inspiration after uh, the uh, horrifically embarrassing uh, 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 Zoom bomb. Um, there is nothing like uh, feeling helpless as somebody keeps pumping hardcore pornography onto your screen to all of you fine folks. But anyway, uh, hi Mike, good morning. Here we go. Um, my quarantine haiku for the day. Recently Zoom bombed, things they don't teach you in law school ending unsought porn. Thank you very much. Okay, on to where we are with the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, it, has been a, it has been a crazy week. Um, just when I, I think I'm gonna have an evening um, where I can um, kick back and relax and take a little, you know, take a little me time, uh, the Department of Labor drops 124 pages of regulations on us all to you know, dude, you are just okay. You know, you cannot you you cannot account for some people. What are you gonna do? Um. Anyway, um, we are um, uh, just when I thought I was gonna get a night to myself where I could um, relax um, and be, uh, you know, and be, um, be chill. Um, we get, uh, you know, we get, um, we get uh, 124 pages of regulations that the Department of Labor drops on us. Um, and so, you know, there we are. I'm gonna keep removing people um, that I see and we're gonna do the best we can to keep this um, as PC as possible. The good thing is the recording, I don't think, is going to um, is going to show any of this. It's just going to show me. So, man, people really are. Uh, I'm killing people as I see it, and we're going to do the best we can. But in the meantime. My suggestion would be that we just, um, uh, I think what I'm gonna have to do from now on. Man, good, I'm glad people aren't, I'm glad people aren't seeing it. Um, I'm seeing some things on my screen. 
um, maybe switch to, if we switch to speaker view, um, maybe that'll help y'all, but whatever. I'm just gonna keep on, I'm just gonna keep on going. Um, yeah, you know, I can't, I know the comments. Freeze video. How do I do? Yes. I'm learning as I'm going on. So if someone knows how to freeze the video, I would love to do that. Otherwise, we're just gonna kind of keep this going as it goes on. Anyway, um, we're just gonna keep rolling and we'll see how this goes. Um, to uh, uh, where we are with the regulations, the Department of Labor put out 124 pages of regs um, that has um, uh, changed a lot of things in where we are in Department of Labor land uh, with the uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, starting with, and I'm gonna start with, was the biggest change, which really caused my, um, just about caused my jaw to hit the floor when the regs first came out, which was that the Department of Labor said that um, an employee who was uh, uh, under a government issued shelter in place or stay at home order was subject to a quarantine or isolation order for purposes of um, for purposes of uh, uh, purposes of uh, qualifying for leave under the Act, um, I um, I have uh, gone back and forth in my brain over and over and over again in terms of um, in terms of what this was going to look like for uh, employers. I toiled with the idea, does this mean that anytime there's a state stay at home or shelter in place order, anybody that can't work is going to uh, be qualified for, a, for 80 hours of paid sick leave under the act. Ultimately, where I came down, for, where I came down on the issue, um, let's see. Okay, uh, I'm working through issues, folks, as I see people continue to continue to kind of type things in the chat room. I'm learning as I go on this Zoom thing, so um, it is what it is. Uh, I would say if people are going to be ignorant, they're going to be ignorant, and we'll, um, I'm just going to ignore the people I can ignore, and we're going to move on from there. Um, anyway, so where I come down on this issue is because the um, regulations say that in order to qualify for the paid sick leave under a, um, uh, a state uh, stay at home or shelter in place order, uh, you have to be, um, uh, the order has to cause the employee to be unable to work for an essential business that is open and has work available for employees. I do not believe those employees qualify. So at least in that regard, while I think the headline screamed a lot has changed at the end of the day, um, I don't, I don't think much has. Is there a way to block guys from this? Um, uh, the answer is, um, if I had somebody with me running this and managing this, the answer would probably be yes. But as I'm trying to talk and read the chat and manage the tech at the same time, um, there is, um, uh, there is um, really not much I can do about it other than trying to figure out for next time um, uh, maybe a better way to get the invite out to block people uh, from coming in in the first place. Um, so I'm working on it as I work through these tech issues. Um, and, you know, if people are going to show their ignorance, they're going to show their ignorance. There's not much. Um, for now, I'm going to be able um, to do about that. Okay, moving quickly through the regs, I want to leave time for, um, I want to leave time for people's questions. Um, for an uh, uh, employee who is taking a leave, um, who is uh, uh, caring for an individual, the regs made a key definition in terms of what that individual must be that someone is caring for. Uh, the regulations clearly say an individual that one is caring for to qualify for paid sick leave um, is an employee's immediate family member. We always assume that to be the case. Um, 
a person who regular, regularly resides in the employee's home. We always assume that to be the case. Um, and then it also says a similar person with whom the employee has a relationship that creates an expectation that the employee would care for the person if he or she were quarantined or self-quarantined. What does that mean? That means someone that you um, have a relationship with that would imply or indicate that you are responsibility for caring for the person. Maybe it's a neighbor that you look in, you look in on, maybe it's a family friend, um, maybe it's someone else you have a close relationship with. If you have a relationship with someone that suggests that you have some kind of care responsibility for them, then the regulations clearly say that you can um, take a leave, um, uh, take a paid sick leave under the act to care for that person. They go on and maybe the key definition is, is in the negative. It says individual does not include persons with whom the employee has no personal relationship. So uh, maybe that implies if there is a personal relationship, then you can take a paid leave to care for that person for a coronavirus, a coronavirus related absence. Um, leave to care for a son or daughter. We got a lot of guidance on this from the IRS um, earlier in the week in terms of how you claim the tax credit in terms of child care related absences. Uh, the Department of Labor with one key difference mirrors the um, IRS guidance on the payroll tax credit, um, leave to care for a son or daughter um, whose school is closed or child care provider is unavailable, cannot be taken uh, if another suitable person is available who can care for the child during the period of leave, which means that if your wife uh, or husband uh, is home uh, caring for your child, then uh, you cannot take a child care related leave to care for that individual. Um, uh, the only uh, possible exception to that I would see would be if um, you are each taking intermittent leave, for example, where you are each individually taking days, uh, husband takes, um, or dad takes Monday, wife or mom takes Tuesday, dad takes Wednesday, wife takes Thursday, dad takes Friday, whatever, on each, on any given day, one of you is, is uh, you know, one of you is unavailable, and so therefore uh, that could be one possible exception to that. Um, another key uh, expansion we saw in the regs is the definition of child care provider. Um, a child care provider, uh, we always assumed, meant someone who receives compensation for providing child care services. That's clear in the regs, um, uh, including um, center-based child care providers, group home child care providers, um, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, they, the regs make it clear that the child care provider has to be licensed, regulated, uh, or registered under state law. Um, the exception, however, that the regs laid out, which was new to me and I think new to everybody, was that if the child care provider is a family member, friend, or neighbor who regularly cares for the employee's child, he or she need not be compensated or licensed, which means that um, if your uh, grandma watches uh, your kids after school, but grandma can't now because grandma um, doesn't want to be around people because she's uh, over 65 and at risk, or you have a neighbor who's watching kids, but they're not watching kids now because they're self-isolating. self, self -isolating. Um, Even if they're not compensated or regulated, uh, they still qualify as a, um, as a child care provider. Um, intermittent leave, there's been some um, uh, differences on, intermit on how intermittent leave is handled. Um, intermittent leave um, is under the act is only available for school and child care related absences and only if the employer and the employee agree on that intermittent leave. Um, intermittent leave is not allowed for any other reason, uh, which from a public health standpoint makes sense. You don't want employees taking intermittent leave because they're sick or they're under self-quarantine or they're caring for someone else who's sick. You, you don't want those people coming back to work um, until they are healthy to come back to work uh, and they are uh, symptom free and free to break quarantine or isolation. So I think for that public health reason, the Department of Labor smartly um, and correctly limited um, intermittent leave only to employees uh, taking a, a school closure or child care related um, child care related leave. Uh, substitution of leave is another area that we saw some changes um, all along. Um, the DOL has, or the, the, we've been interpreting the statute, and I think the DOL and their Q&As that they put out last week said that we couldn't, employers couldn't impose any sequencing of leave, we couldn't force employees to take any available paid leave under a company policy before we, uh, before they took leave 
under the FFCRA, and that is still mostly true. You can't force employees to exhaust their PTO before they take paid sick leave. Um, what the act does say, however, is for the first um, two weeks of unpaid FMLA for childcare related absences under the act, an employer can, during those two weeks, um, force employees to use their uh, existing uh, PTO, uh, vacation time, other paid time off that the employer has available via its policies that the employees have to take. That can be imposed on employees during that two weeks of unpaid, the initial two weeks of unpaid FMLA. Um, and so that's a, a big change from what we had previously thought uh, was going to be the case um, under the regulations. Um, lastly, I just want to talk for a second about um, notice and documentation before we get into the um, uh, open it up to Q&A. Um, uh, we saw some guidance from the IRS um, earlier in the week. We saw the DOL regs Wednesday made a couple of key points. Number one, uh, if you're going to claim the tax credit, you have to have documentation for the leave and what's uh, set forth in the DOL regs mirrors what the IRS has said an employer has to uh, maintain and keep uh, for purposes of documenting the payroll tax credit available under the act. Um, that is, you have to have uh, a record of the employees, the, the employee taking the leave's name, the dates for which the leave is requested, the qualifying reason for the leave, um, and an oral or written statement that the employee is unable to work because of the qualified reason for the leave. And the oral or written is key. Um, there's nothing in the act or the regs or the guidance we got from the IRS on claiming the payroll tax credit, suggesting or saying that this, the, the records that you have um, the documentation has to be written documentation from the employee. And in fact, um, the regs make it clear that the employee can make an oral request for leave. It doesn't have to be in writing, but you have to have a written record to, for documentation purposes for claiming the payroll tax credit. So what I am recommending is that you have a form, right? You have a paid sick leave or a, a expanded paid FMLA form for employees but that you're not requiring employees to fill out to fill out that form as a prerequisite to getting the leave like we do for traditional FMLA. What we're instead doing is allowing employees to make an oral request for the leave, but then someone in HR or management or somebody is then documenting the information required to be tracked on that leave form so that you then have a paper record, a required, the required written record to support the leave for purposes of claiming the payroll tax credit. Additional information, um, that you need to get depending specifically on the need for the leave being taken uh, for paid sick leave based on a government quarantine or isolation order uh, the employee must provide the name of the government entity that issued the order for paid sick leave based on the advice of a health care provider to self-quarantine uh, due to concerns related to coronavirus the employee must provide the name of the health care provider that made that recommendation or gave that advice um, for paid sick leave relating to the care of an individual who was subject to a government, uh, governmental or self-quarantine order, the employee must provide the name of the government entity um, that issued that order or the name of the healthcare provider um, uh, that, made, that provided that advice. And then for childcare related absences, um, the employee must provide the name of the school, place of care or childcare provider that is closed or become unavailable, um, the name of the child being cared for, and then a representation that no other person will be caring for the child during the period for which uh, employees take leave under the act. Um, I wanna make one um, additional point about this child care related leave and one huge discrepancy between the IRS Q&A guidance that came out earlier this week and the DOL regs. Um, the IRS guidance puts a 14 year age get limit on child care related leave in terms of claiming the tax credit. So the IRS says that uh, for you can only claim the tax, the payroll tax credit, if you are caring for a child age 14 or under, um, unless special circumstances exist such that you have to care for someone older than age, older than age 14, such as someone under some kind of disability or something like that. Um, the DOL, the statute, first of all, clearly, and then the DOL regulations make no such um, uh, delineation at age 14 or otherwise, it just says child, right? And so as the IRS guidance is written, uh, if you read that in conjunction with the Department of Labor regulations, 
Uh, I suppose the only reasonable reading is you have to offer childcare related leave for anyone caring for a child under the age of 18, but you can only claim the payroll tax credit for caring for children under the age of 15. So if you're caring for a child between ages 15, 16, and 17, you wouldn't qualify for the payroll tax credit. Um, I think um, what we have seen, uh, or what I think we will see, is that that likely won't stand because I don't think there's any statutory basis to make that delineation at age 15. So I think stay, stay tuned. I assume we'll see more detailed regulations from the IRS. Um, and I would assume, I'm hoping that that what they say in their initial guidance um, will not uh, come to fruition either when they're processing the payroll tax credit or when they are, um, when they put their final regs out because I don't think it's supported um, by the statute at all. Okay, we're gonna go to the, re go to the questions um, and I need to, um, I need to, uh, I'll scroll through the questions, kind of ask them as they came in um, and ignore those I don't wanna read uh, or are not appropriate to read. Um, number one, please talk about requirements for employees to be eligible to take 12 weeks off. We had so many employees request off that we are struggling to run our business. What recourse do I have to deny or modify their leave? Um, so in order for the employees to take the 12 weeks of expanded FMLA, they have to be um, caring for a child. Uh, they have to be uh, the child's school, uh, uh, child care center or other available caregiver is not available to, due to a coronavirus related reason. Um, and there has to be, the employee has to certify that there is nobody else uh, available in the home to care for the child during the time at which the employee is taking the leave of absence. That's what the employee has to show. Um, in terms of what recourse do you have to deny or modify their leave? Um, the answer is, if that's what the employee wants to take, uh, you really don't have any recourse. What the Department of Labor is uh, asking employers and employees to do is work collaboratively in order to um, uh, ease the operational burden on employers. If you're a manufacturer and you have people that you need to physically be in your location um, to uh, uh, working, um, there may not be much you can do if they're the sole child care provider and, and they need to be home to care for their children. Um, uh, if someone is able to work remotely, uh, I would encourage employers to work out remote work schedules with their employees that would allow the employees to get their work done around their child care related needs, such that if someone has to care for their kid between, you know, nine and three or nine and five or whatever, to have employees run their work schedule from six to nine in the morning and then again from, you know, five to 10 at night or whatever it is. Um, it, talk to your employees. As with most employee issues, communication is key. Um, my suggestion would be to uh, you know have a conversation with the employee or employees uh, those that you can to see if there are ways to have their schedule work that you can maintain operations and they can care for their children such that everybody comes out of this um, you know, getting what they need out of the arrangement. Um, uh, but if an employee says you know if it's a physical you know in the facility job and an employee says, look, I, I have to be home to work for my kid and your shift runs from eight to five and my kid's four years old and I have no one else to watch him, you're not gonna have a choice. You're gonna have to grant the leave for 12 weeks. It's, it's federally guaranteed and, and protected um, leave. Okay. Uh, I'm getting a lot of questions around continuation of non-group health benefits while receiving uh, expanded paid sick leave or expanded family medical leave. Do we have to allow accrual of vacation and PTO? Do we have to continue 401k contributions? Can you comment on this? You rock. Thanks for filling us in among all these disgusting <laughs> distractions. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, the rules are going to run the same as they do under the FMLA. The rules haven't changed. I mean, this is an amendment to the Family Medical Leave Act, at least in regards to the EFMLA. So the rules. Um, the rules are going to be the same. Uh, you're going to keep employees on group health insurance, for example. Um, you will 
require them or you have the right to require them to continue to contribute to their group health insurance uh, for their share of the premiums during their um, during their um, during their uh, FMLA leave of absence during the paid sick leave the same you're going to keep them on health insurance they're going to um, you're going to deduct the premiums uh, from uh, you know from the pay they're getting uh, from the paid sick leave they're collecting um, it's going to reduce the benefit to them but it's going to keep their insurance going so um, the rules are not going to be different um, of course you could always choose uh, as you can under the FMLA um, not to require employees to continue contributing to their group health insurance while they're on an unpaid leave, for example. Um, you could, in these, there, there's lots of ways to structure this with employees, particularly where we are now, understanding that people are out of work or wondering where their jobs are going to be or how they're going to make a living. I mean, you could waive that requirement. You could um, float it as a loan to employees to get back from them at some point in the future through a, you know, through an authorized payroll deduction when things come back to normal. There's lots of things we can do. Um, this, of course, all depends on an employer's financial ability to carry those expenses, um, but lots of things we as employers can do to help our employees through this. Um, but under the statute, the rules haven't changed in terms of what you are allowed to do in terms of requiring contributions from employees to these um, to these uh, uh, um, for these for these group health benefits and you know, uh, I almost hate to point this out, given where we are with unemployment and everything else, but the FMLA also has the hammer that if someone takes a leave of absence and does not return from that leave of absence at the end of the FMLA, um, the employer always has the right to uh, require from the employee that the employee pay back all of the group health premiums that the employer paid on the employee's behalf while the employee was out on leave. That hammer still exists in the FMLA. Um, and, and that is a right that, that employers have. If someone takes their 12 weeks of childcare related leave, you kept them on health insurance, they don't come back. Uh, that hammer exists. Um, and again, I mean, if people are unemployed, there's the blood from, blood from a stone problem, I suppose, but that's there for employers if they wanna, if they wanna exhaust that um, also. How does the FFCRA leave affect exempt employees for intermittent leave when they get two thirds of their salary um, for those days? Um, the, the answer is yes. If they're, taking, if they're taking intermittent leave for an exempt employee, um, there are exceptions to the Fair Labor Standards Act for payroll deductions from exempt employees for intermittent leave. You would pay them um, for their own, um, you know, for their own coronavirus related absences, their own illness or quarantine or self-isolation, um, they get 100% of their salary capped at $511 per day for uh, care for, a, you know, care for someone else or child care related absences. It's two thirds um, of their um, regular salary capped at $200 per day. Uh, that's how it's going to work under, if you read the FFCRA in conjunction with the Fair Labor Standards Act regulations that allow uh, salary reductions for intermittent FMLA leave. Um, that's how that's uh, that's how that's going to work. Okay. Let's see. Man, I'm reading this chat now and good Lord. Um, what do you understand ground number six under the EPSL to mean? Thank you. Um, I have no idea. Uh, no one knows what ground number six under the E, uh, under the paid sick leave means. Um, uh, reason number six for paid sick leave is um, a similar, you know, a similar, um, you know, something similar to coronavirus that causes employees to be absent, uh, you know, a substantially similar health related issue. No one knows what that means. It was um, uh, uh, surprisingly absent the, from the regulations the DOL gave, um, gave uh, uh, 
explanations for the first five reasons as to what those definitionally what they mean and left out reason number six. Nobody knows if I was using my best guess, maybe um, it's, it, it, it's a catch all in the event the virus mutates and we end up with somewhere between now and the end of 2020 instead of COVID-19, COVID-20, because the virus mutates and we don't have um, the current strain of coronavirus anymore, but it's a different strain of coronavirus, maybe, um, but no one really knows um, what that means because we've gotten absolutely no guidance and, and really uh, reasons one through five are going to cover just about all the absences employees are going to need to take for uh, uh, related to coronavirus. Um, and so I'm, I'm essentially ignoring reason number six, um, but we haven't seen um, we haven't seen yet any uh, any guidance as to what that what that reason number six means. Is there a form or best practice for tracking and holding the proof? Yeah, so my my recommended best practice would be creating a um, uh, creating a paid sick leave form and an EFMLA form for either an employee who's able to fill it out to fill it out or um, for someone in the company to fill it out for the employee, you take a, you know, you sign it as, you know, authorized by the employee on this date. It's going to contain all the information that the IRS is going to require in, per, in terms of um, submitting the payroll tax credit. And then you, you know, stick that in the same place you would stick all of an employee's other kind of FMLA related uh, uh, or sick leave related documents. Um, you can make a copy of it and create a separate folder for specifically for uh, this, uh, uh, for paid sick leave and expanded uh, FMLA under the statute. Um, you can then, you know, create spreadsheets. I know that HRIS systems are also being changed to, or have been changed to track all this as well. Um, uh, but um, just your best bet is to have a separate form that either the employee is going to fill out or you're going to fill out for the employee per the employee's authorization. It's going to have all the information um, that you need for purposes of tracking this for the for the um, for the payroll tax credit. Can parents use intermittent leave for the couple of hours a day they are homeschooling when the remainder of the day is worked remotely? Uh, for example, two hours of intermittent leave and six hours of remote work if the employer allows that. Um, the answer is uh, yes, but and it's a big but, but only if um, it's agreed upon by the employer and the employee. So intermittent leave of intervals less than a day uh, for child care related leave is available under the statute, but only upon an, ex an express agreement of the employer and the employee. So I would recommend um, uh, that uh, and the Department of Labor recommends as well, and it's and it's good it's good solid advice that employers and employees work collaborative collaboratively here to make this work for everybody as best as possible. So that if you have um, if you have employees that need um, you know to take a couple of hours of intermittent leave in the middle of the day, they're otherwise working remotely um, because they need to monitor or help their kids or facilitate homeschooling or whatever. Um, that you work with your employees to do that and that you not um, just deny the right to take intermittent leave. Um, you're going to end up losing employees that way. Employees are going to, are going to quit their jobs and go on unemployment if they're not getting the, um, the flexibility they need to work from home. So uh, my suggestion is that employers um, as best as their operations allow them to uh, work um, collaboratively with some, with employees to create the flexible schedules that employees need that will allow them a to get their jobs done and b to take care of whatever they have to take care of at home so then however long we're going to be um, at home uh, dealing with this if a parent has a 14 plus age kid and a younger child will they still qualify um, yeah i mean i think you're going to qualify regardless as long as you're taking care of a child um, uh, you're going to qualify. The question is, if someone is over the age of 14, um, are they going to qualify for the payroll tax credit? I think when push comes to shove, they will qualify for that as well. But I think if you're taking care of someone that is uh, age um, 14 and under, whether or not you also have someone at home that's older than, older than age 14, I think that's clearly going to qualify 
um, for the payroll tax credit. Um, someone says number six is all of the duties is assigned clauses is for future qualified reasons to be defined by the federal government. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I think it is, um, that is reason number six is a catch-all. We're not quite sure what that catch-all means, um, but it clearly was put in there so the statute wouldn't have to be either further legislation wouldn't have to be enacted or further um, uh, the statute wouldn't have to be amended in the event that something else came down the road um, between now and December 31, 2020 that would otherwise qualify employees for, um, for leaves of absence. Have you heard whether the DOL will issue new FMLA notice that includes these reasons do we still have to abide by FMLA rules and regs for this? Um, uh, the answer is um, no. Um, I haven't heard whether the DOL will issue new FMLA notices. And in fact, what I've heard through the grapevine is that they won't be, although that's not been said definitively by the DOL. I think it's being left up to employers to um, either modify existing FMLA forms or create new forms out of whole cloth and then create forms out of paid sick leave. That's what we're doing for our clients. Um, at, um, at the firm, we're creating forms that we're gonna provide to our clients um, that will um, document the need for these leaves with the information necessary for employers to then turn around and use those for purposes of claiming the, um, the payroll tax credit. How would you handle self-quarantine? We are deemed an essential business. Um, if this is under the like a state stay at home or uh, shelter in place order, um, if employees are uh, it, if employees are unable, there, there isn't an employee who is unable. If you're an employee of an essential business, that is that where the business is open and there is work available, a state stay at home or shelter in place order is not going to qualify that employee for. Uh, uh, paid sick leave under reason one in the act, um, period. Um, if there's work available for the employee. If an employee is self-quarantining um, under reason, uh, under one of the other reasons, that is, you know, a, a medical professional is recommending or, requir or recommending or requiring or advising the employee to self-quarantine either because the employee is ill or has been exposed, um, then, you are, whether you're an essential business or not, you're gonna to have to provide paid sick leave for that employee, provided the employee gives you the name of the medical professional that is advising the employee to self-quarantine for however long the employee is being recommended to self-quarantine. How are you advising clients who have an employee whose household member is under a quarantine awaiting test results should those employees stay home? Uh, yes, they should. Um, we know uh, epi from an epidemiological standpoint, we understand that you can be and likely are a silent carrier uh, or can be a silent carrier if you've been exposed um, for up to 14 days before you exhibit symptoms. Um, if somebody uh, in the employee's home has uh, coronavirus-like symptoms, um, fever, cough, shortness of breath, um, and is awaiting test results, that employee should be uh, quarantined at home um, until the family member gets a, gets a negative result. If the, if the family member gets a positive result, then the employee should be quarantining at home as well. Um, if they get a note from a medical professional recommending that they quarantine along with the employee and along with their family member until the test results come out, that will qualify for paid sick leave under the act. Um, also, uh, but what you don't want is someone who is a potential vector for the infection, that is they've been exposed and are carrying it to come into your workplace because then everyone in your workplace that they come in contact with potentially becomes a vector as well. And what you might end up having, ha having to do is shut down your entire operation for a period of 14 days um, to allow everybody to clear quarantine and then come back to work. So yeah, if someone Household members under quarantine awaiting test results, they should definitely stay home until either those results come back negative or if they come back positive um, until they are 14 days, until the family member is um, symptom free for 72 hours and then, the, and, then, um, uh, and then the employee is 14 days clear of the time frame in which they could potentially have been exposed. Um, 
what is the definition of care for an individual under reason number four for paid sick leave if the employee's spouse is told by a doctor to stay home until symptoms improve what exactly is the care the spouse provides that allows them to use paid sick leave um, uh, it's unclear what care is um, but because um, this leave is not allowed to be used intermittently, we can presume that it's some kind of regular care for an individual. I don't think it's defined that way in the statute or in the regulations, however. It is um, uh, watching over, taking care of, um, and I'm giving a really bad answer to this question because it's really unclear. I think if someone has responsibility for another individual's well-being, I think that's sufficient to qualify for care. If someone's in your home um, and they're ill, that's going to qualify for care. If you have a family member that's ill that you're watching over, um, I think that's going to qualify for care as well. Um, I think um, if it's even a neighbor that you're looking out for, maybe you're going grocery shopping for them, um, that may even qualify for care under the statute um, as well. I think it's a really open-ended um, definition. The point, however, is that this leave cannot be taken intermittently. So if someone takes one of these care-related leaves, um, they're out for the duration of that care, whatever that is. And so if someone in their house is ill, for example, um, they're out until that person is 72 hours fever-free, um, and that's all going to be paid until they exhaust their um, until they exhaust their leave. In calculating the employee's regular rate of pay, does the employer calculation go back six months at the time of the leave request or from April 1? I think it's from the time of the leave request. You take a six-month average um, looking back, and I, and I believe it's from the time the leave request was made to figure out what the employee's um, regular rate is. We have a state stay-at-home order, but for essential employees. Um, one county advises seniors to stay home, neighboring county does not. Seniors at the essential business get leave in one county but not the other. If a state stay-at-home order is requiring people age 65 and over to stay home, um, even if they work for an essential business, then the, the governmental order is, um, is the cause for the employee not to be working. And in that case, I would think that that's a situation where a state shelter in place or stay at home order would qualify the individual for the leave. If you have a broad state order that does not contain that requirement, right, that does not impose a requirement on senior citizens to stay home and allows them to go to work for an essential business, but you have a city or county order that's more restrictive, you may have a situation, as pointed out in the question, where some employees of the employer, um, employee that works for County A that requires seniors to stay home might qualify for paid sick leave where, where uh, uh, employees who live in County B that does not have that similar requirement are just subject to, this, to the broader state order that allows them to go to work for the essential business, um, they would not qualify for the paid sick leave under reason one. Under EFMLA, can exempt employees be converted to hourly to better track intermittent leave? Um, sure, sure. Um, you can absolutely um, convert um, an exempt employee to a salaried employee to track intermittent leave, uh, or about a, a salaried employee to an hourly employee. Understand that if once you make that conversion, if the employee works more than 40 hours in a week, you're going to owe them overtime. Um, they're no longer going to be exempt. So you're going to have to pay them overtime if they're working more than 40 hours in a week. Um, but for purposes of ease of tracking, you can, um, uh, for the next however many months, convert someone salaried um, to hourly, understanding that you're going to lose the benefit of the exemption and you have to pay them overtime. Um, can I speak to the small business exemption? Um, sure. Um, if you are under... 50 employees, uh, you can deem yourself exempt only from the child care related um, uh, provisions of the Paid Sick Leave Act, reason number five, um, and the uh, expanded FMLA. Um, and that's for 
one of three reasons only under the regulations. Um, and, and before I get into the reasons, I want to make clear that it is um, a decision made by an officer of the company. It is um, self uh, effectuating, you don't apply to the DOL to be declared exempt. An officer of the corporation makes the determination that the business falls into one of three categories. Either that providing that paid leave for child care related absences um, will um, essentially cause the business to run out of money. You won't be able to, uh, you won't have enough money to maintain continuing operations. Or number two, the individual or individuals that are requesting the leave are so important to the business that if they're not working, the business can't continue. Or reason number three, so many employees are requesting leave that the quantity of employees requesting leave um, are so many that the um, that the um, individual that the company will not be able to maintain minimal operations with so many employees uh, with so many employees out. Um, with regards to reason number three, do the employees need to provide documentation in order to qualify? Um, you need to provide, um, you just have to identify the, the name of the healthcare provider um, that is uh, recommending um, that, the, that, the, that the individual not work. With the, with the name, with the identity or name of that provider, then, um, uh, then yes, um, that is, uh, that's sufficient. You don't, the, you're not, the, the DOL is not requiring like a written doctor's note or a written, any kind of written paperwork um, consistent with CDC guidelines that we not be overburdening our healthcare providers right now. All they require is the actual, is the actual um, identity. Um, don't change exempt to non-exempt is not necessary. No, it's not necessary. The question was, could you, um, you absolutely can, um, but no, it is. It is definitely. Um, it is definitely not necessary under the um, under the DOL regulations. Um, under the rather the DOL the wage hour regulations, um, you can simply make pro rata deductions, but it's not necessary. Um, it's not necessary to do. Um, for salaried intermittent leave, can you mix federal and company sick leave so they are whole? Um, you are allowed to top, the, the regulations speak in terms of topping off. You are allowed to top off um, paid sick leave um, or even paid family leave after the initial two weeks provided um, uh, uh, either the employer can do it um, uh, 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 or, or the employee can choose to do it, can, can tap into paid leave to top off. Um, can you mandate that employees use the new sick leave for the first two weeks of, of expanded family medical leave? No, you cannot. Um, that's, that is the employee's choice. What you can do during the first two weeks of unpaid is require that employees tap into their existing company provided um, paid time off. An employee has a spouse with a compromised immune system. His doctor has recommended she self quarantine so she doesn't infect him but she has no health issues or symptoms. As of now, he does not need care. Does she qualify? Um, uh, uh, potentially, I mean, you would, the, the employee would need to get a note or some kind of recommendation from a healthcare provider that the employee not work or the employee self-quarantine. If a doctor makes that recommendation, then the employee is gonna, then the employee is gonna qualify for the paid sick leave but it depends on the specific recommendation that the employee's doctor was making. Absent the recommendation or, or uh, the recommendation of a physician, however, uh, the employee's not gonna qualify. Um, I'm trying to scroll through and not, um, not repeat questions that have already been asked. Um, What if you have an employee who turned in a medical note from their doctor, which said the employee has asthma and the employee is requesting not to come back until April 30 because he is at a higher risk of being exposed to coronavirus, but the doctor did not say they are recommending that. 
So an employee has a medical note which said the employee has asthma and the employee and the and the employee is requesting not to come back until April 30. Um, that if the if the physician is not recommending it might it probably doesn't qualify for paid sick leave. However, I would potentially, I mean, you have to consider asthma is um, uh, an ADA disability. I would treat that as a request for a reasonable accommodation by the employee for an, un, for an unpaid leave of absence as a reasonable accommodation under the ADA. Um, and I would do one of two things. You can either grant the unpaid leave of absence through April 30 to the employee that's unpaid or better for the employee, you can put the employee, you could put the employee on furlough through April 30 for a coronavirus related reason, which would allow the employee to apply for and collect unemployment. So the employee would still be getting paid for the duration of the absence um, uh, through unemployment, some amount through unemployment, uh, maybe, maybe all of their wages or at least a portion of their wages. Um, as opposed to the employee taking an unpaid leave of absence, which is what the ADA uh, suggests would be a reasonable accommodation in that case, and then the employee's going for the entire month of April without, um, without getting paid. Um, um, essential business is still exempt from stay-at-home orders, correct? Um, it depends on the, on the language of the state order. In the state of Ohio, um, where I am, um, if you are in one of the 25 defined categories of an essential business, then yes, you are exempt from the stay at home order. Um, you're open for business. Your employees um, can come into your place of business and work provided that you have the, the required kind of health and safety measures in place. Um, employees are maintaining appropriate social distancing. You have, you know, hand sanitizer and hand washing stations. You're employees are directed to wash their hands for 20 seconds. Um, you're sanitizing the workplace on a regular basis and whatnot. So, but yeah, if you are an essential business um, under, I think just about all the state stay at home orders, you are, you are open and your employees can come in to, uh, can come in to work. Um, am I understanding correctly that the 80 hours of paid sick leave is to be used all together if it's being used due to sickness, self or someone caring for, uh, but it's being nested with the uh, expanded FMLA for childcare purposes, it can be used intermittently. Um, that is correct. You still get the payroll tax credit, um, but for any reason other than a childcare related absence, the leave must be used in a block as long as the reason for that leave um, exists. You don't have and it's for public health related reasons. You don't want employees who are, who have been ex exposed or who are sick um, taking leave on Monday and then coming to work on Tuesday, right? You want them taking their leave um, in, on a contiguous basis such that they are isolating or quarantining and not spreading the virus. And so it's not, it, this, isn't, this isn't being done to punish the employees, it's being actually done to protect the rest of your employees um, from this, from an unnecessary spread of the virus because employees think they have to come into work um, while they're sick or isolated or quarantined or caring for someone um, who is. So yeah, for reasons one through, for reasons one through four, um, the leave must be taken in a block as long as the reason for that leave exists. For reason number five, school and child care related absences, it can be taken, um, it can be taken intermittently. Um, the only exemption under uh, paid sick leave and expanded family medical leave is for child care. For small businesses, yes. Uh, oh, I'm for healthcare related. For healthcare related healthcare providers, um, they they can they're exempt as to everything. So for the small business exemption is for sick child care related absences only. For healthcare providers, that's a broader exemption that applies to all the provisions um, in the all the paid sick leave and family leave provisions. Um, in the act and, and the definition of healthcare provider is so broad in the statute that is basically any business that touches the medical industry, um, their employees are going to be um, uh, exempt. Um, those are, oh, if one employee tests positive, do we need to shut down our entire facility? Um, that's a business call. I will tell you that if you have an employee that tests positive, um, 
the EEOC has said that it might be an, an exception to your confident to the confidentiality provisions in the ADA to let employees know that you had someone who tests positive um, and even maybe identify the individual um, to those on a need to know basis. Um, so depending on how broad, uh, uh, you know, how wide that person moved around your facility, um, it's possible you may have the ability to notify everyone that the person tested positive and even who the person is. You can at least certainly identify that someone has tested positive. Um, at a minimum, I think you have a, because we're do uh, to me, because I think we have an obligation to limit community spread here. Um, I think we we have, an, uh, to me, I think if someone in your workplace tests positive and you can confirm a workplace exposure, I think you shut down for 14 days. You perform a deep clean, everybody comes home for 14 days, and then you bring people back once they break quarantine, once they clear quarantine, that is they haven't, they've been home for 14 days and they have no symptoms, then you can start bringing people back. But to me, if you have someone physically in your business that tests positive, and you can um, confirm uh, that they uh, potentially exposed everybody in the business, then I think you shut down. If you can um, map out that they potentially maybe did not expose everybody, but maybe they were in one building, or I think you have to decide what you shut down based on where the potential exposure vectors are. But if you, if you think you have a broad-based exposure and you can't guarantee that your workplace is the entire workplace is free and safe from coronavirus, then I think you shut down, send people home for 14 days, bring them back as they break quarantine or clear quarantine. And in the meantime, you do these deep, deep cleaning uh, and, um, and um, sanitation. So with that, it is now 1056. I'm going to bring in my daughter, who I was told last time uh, people enjoyed more than me. So I am going to bring her in to play yet another song for everybody. I'm going to do this. We, let's do this, see her and Laura. Hi. We're going to close that so we don't give her quite as much backlighting. We're going to do this. For those that weren't here last time, this is my daughter, Nora. Nora is almost 14. She will likely celebrate her birthday while next month while we were, while we were all under self-isolation at home. Um, she was supposed to be in Quebec for her eighth grade class trip that has now been canceled. Um, but uh, for those that don't know, she's a live working professional musician, um, fronts a band called Fake ID, and she has agreed uh, to come in and play another song for everybody. Um, what's the song called, Nora? It's called Boys Like You. It's not a fake ID. It's like my own song. So it's not a fake ID song. It's her own original, her own original song. She says it will eventually be a fake ID song when they can all get back together and rehearse again. It's called Boys Like You. It is called Boys Like You. The first time she's ever played it for anybody, right? Oh, she put it on Instagram yesterday. Okay. Um, anyway, take it away, Nora. Thousand words, thousand lines, thousand tears, 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 thousand t
Thank you, Nora. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, we'll see everybody uh, next time. Have a good uh, Have a good day and weekend. Awesome. Take care, everybody.